Semantics clearly, you know, first of all, is one of those, you know, one of those fields of language that it is more controversial than others. There's, if there are many theories of syntax, there's even more theories of semantics, and so the dust hasn't settled for us to actually know what it is. But, but one thing that impinges on it, because one of the one of the main semantic functions is reference. Right? There is there are words without a reference, like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Which, well, which has a literary referent, but not a referent in the world. But when we're talking about language as, as active and engaged in, 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 in everyday non-linguistic practices, then we have to consider that it's referring to things that are out there, like oxygen, with, that, with the thing that I began the, the conversation with. Uh, and so the question of reference needs to be, a, 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 this is one, the one aspect of semantics that I want to be able to, to, to answer you. Uh, first of all, in order to get our theory of reference right, we need to take, we need to decide what theory of experience are we going to, are we going to follow. I, 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 have, I gave a talk about this last year, so I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. But the two options is the Kantian theory of experience, in which experience is given coherence and stability conceptually, and then it became the Neo-Kantian theory when Saussure's arbitrary or the signifier replaced Kantian concepts, and now this everybody cuts out its own world with language. Or do you side with Hume, for whom language has nothing to do, well, Hume or Bergson, for whom language has nothing to do with experience. Experience is all about raw intensities, raw colors, raw sounds, raw flavors, raw aromas, and, in, and including intensity as it comes from the inside. The, the feeling of humiliation, the feeling of pride, the feeling of joy, the feeling of sadness. It's also very Spinozian, right? in which you cannot put words into that. And the more intense the feeling, the less you can put words to it. Intensities explode language from within. Right? And when you go in a Humean direction, you will go, of course, in a, uh, in a Kantian direction, reference, you know, for instance, Gottlob Frege, Frege, the great German logician, who, whose theory of, of reference was very influential in Anglo-American circles in analytical philosophy, according to whom I can refer to that, a chair, <laughs> to that, to that chair, because I know the meaning of the word chair. The meaning of the word chair is what allows me to then refer to a chair. And that is the Neo-Kantian theory of reference to this day. That's only one aspect of semantics, but it's an important aspect of semantics. In a human tradition, for instance, when you're trying to define, you have a piece of yellow, shiny metal, and you say, is this gold? You know, is this what the word gold referred to? You don't go to a dictionary and try to find out the meaning of the word gold to decide whether this is gold or not. You take it to an assayer, right? A chemist that's going to throw sulfuric acid and do all kinds of non-linguistic interventions into the referent to try to find out, oh, no, sir, yeah, they fool you. This is fool's God. Is it, is, is it almost as good as real gold? No. It's not gold at all. But the meaning of the word, get out of my store, right? In other words, reference is achieved via non-linguistic practices. This is what Foucault tried to, tried to bring on in, in Discipline and Punish, which is something that has never been understood by people. If you ask the majority of Neocantians whether, whether, whether imprisonment and torture, you know, waterboarding, is a discursive or a non-discursive practice, 
They are going to tell you that it is a discursive practice. You would just want to water bore those people, right? To put, it, to put it in a nutshell, matching a category of crime to a category of, of punishment, say, you stole something with your hand, therefore I'm going to cut your hand off, that is discursive. You're taking two categories, or the meaning of two categories, and matching them because there's a relationship of resemblance or similarity between them. You stole, you get the hand cut off. But the actual cutting of the hand is non-discursive. And so what Foucault was trying to say in that book is, look, we have only half the story when we are linguisticizing everything. We also need to bring all those causal interventions in reality which make language ultimately stick and which make reference real. That's the name of the guy is actually Frege. Frege. Well, that was, that was then my... Kid philosopher. Yeah, you know, my pigeon German. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question about... Okay, this, so your is your professor of, of philosophy and your theories in architecture schools? Since there's a few of uh, art practitioners in the audience, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how does this philosophy of language, as derived from the blues with all this, apply to, for example, architectural styles with vernacular, and for example, if you see Dubai with this explosion of, I don't know, if it's postmodern, whatever it is that they're doing there, how is that in an intensity, a linguist, a visually or construct, I don't know, how does that affect? Well, I mean, Silvera was talking about that before when he was uh, uh, saying, you know, that we semioticians of the 20th century try to reduce, for instance, the, the language of the face. And let's not even call it the language of the face, the expressivity of the face. Now, those 32 muscles in the architecture of my face can produce something like a thousand different subtle expressions of sadness, of joy, of anger, of exasperation. And, and, and with different degrees of exasperation, like, you know, aggressive, you know, and we tend to then they say, oh, so the language, the face has a language, and then we try to use whatever we've learned about language in terms of grammar and syntax, also there must be some decomposable elements that are combined a certain syntax, and all we need to now find is the equivalent of linguistic rules for the face, instead of saying, no, the face it, 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 instead of distinguishing expressivity in, in, more, in a more general sense from linguistic expressivity, which is just one type of expressivity, there are all kinds of non-linguistic expressivity. Expressivity of your face, expressivity of your hands. I remember one day I was giving a speech about the list and, and the next guy that was going to talk was an Italian. And, and I thought, you know, I, I gave some speech about uh, a difference in repetition, and I was moving my hands, and I thought I was making, you know, a very good use of my hands. And the guy, the Italian guy, stands up and starts talking about the refrain, you know, with the hands like that in a very operatic way. And I thought, oh my God, I not, I don't use my hands. This guy uses his hands. Is that a language, or is that just another form of expressivity? We tend to talk about body language, for postures, for silhouettes, for 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 all kinds of communicative effects and expressive effects we have with our bodies. But we, by using the word language, body language, we are already implying that whatever we have learned about syntax, that whatever we learn about semantics is going to apply directly to the body, instead of speaking of the expressivity of the body. Well, the same thing applies to architectural styles. Right? There's many architects in the 20th century influenced by, by that, the type of semiotics that Silver was correctly criticizing as reductionist who have tried to find a grammar of architecture, literally, a grammar of architecture. There are certain decorative motifs, there are certain ways of, you know, of, of creating a certain a, a different uh, uh, elements of, of a facade, and let's try to find the grammar of that. Instead of saying, look, the, the realm of expressivity is much way vaster than that of language, let's give it its autonomy, and let's create a theory of architectural style and a theory of architectural expression without subordinating it from the beginning to the idea that it must be linguistic, that it must be a language. So, so what, this is another thing that Deleuze, of course, defends a lot because uh, he, among other things, is one of the great philosophers of expression, is precisely the autonomy of all these other forms of expression from linguistic expression. He, there is clearly linguistic expression. There is clearly poetry. There's clearly novels, and there's clearly 
speeches like Obama's speeches that are like extremely expressive. But besides that, there are all, all kinds of realms, including in animal behavior, like bird song, or the way in which they create the territories, in which they, they express themselves with color, with song, with sound. There are certain, there are certain birds which, which express themselves with silhouettes. They just pose for the female and try to cut their silhouette out against some white background to look cool, uh, to mark their territory, to seduce, to perform all kinds of actions that can be performed with language, but they have been performed for ages without language. So it's time that we liberate a theory of expression from semiotics and, and, and linguistics and give it its own autonomy.